Check one, two, good day. So we're, um, we're just going to start by giving some introductions. We're actually waiting for our uh, panel moderator to turn up. But uh, in the meantime, we'll uh, each say who we are, what we do. Um, I'm Lincoln Dale. I work for a company called Arista Networks. And uh, at Arista, I'm a principal engineer. Um, Arista is, um, uh, well, I guess typically the way I like to explain it is one of the most unknown networking companies in the world, but um, probably in uh, uh, more like an open stack environment, we're probably m more well known. So, uh, um, and our involvement with open stack is around uh, uh, a bunch of things related to uh, Neutron, and uh, that's why we're here today. Thanks. Um, John Bustle with PacNet and the token carrier on this group, so hopefully they'll be gentle. Um, we recently announced a kind of pay by the drink, if you will, a bandwidth solution that we're tying back into Neutron and the entire OpenStack community. So we're hoping to do great things with this group. Great. I'm uh, Lou Tucker, CTO of Cloud Computing at Cisco Systems. Um, been an early contributor into Neutron, helped get that separation, pulling networking out of compute. Uh, as you know, OpenStack is made up of the set of these services, and so one of the real advantages of doing that, it's really allowed us to accelerate what we're doing in networking and making an architecture that is easily then extensible into all of the different vendors that you find up here. And so I'm glad to see it, because I've always been wanting to have a telco-provided bandwidth-on-demand solution that we could use to bridge data centers. Uh, my name is San Chi Li. I'm a, a CTO for the Carrier Business Group in Huawei. Uh, yes, uh, Huawei, uh, possibly you know, just recently is uh, elected as a gold member for the OpenStack. So we're fully committed for our infrastructure in the data center and also across data center for the carrier specific requirement. So SDN is certainly is part of it. Okay, it's beyond the data center and also looking into the network edge, how we can leverage this new technology, disruptive technology, and help the carrier and also data center to transform. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Peter Beland um, I, with VMware in the Networking and Security Business Unit. So I work in the office of the CTO under Martin Casado. And uh, most of you in the OpenStack crowd probably know that in uh, at VMware, we're working on the network virtualization components. We're heavily involved with uh, the Neutron uh, framework. And uh, we also, at VMware, is participating in the other components of the stack, but I'm here focused on networking. So, you know, I can in, start with a question, maybe. In lieu of the we, moderator. We, yeah, yeah. We, no, no. <laughs> but we will self moderate. Uh, so maybe we can ask one interesting question we might just ask is this is about the future of networking. But rather than starting there, Nicholas Carr years ago said, you know, IT doesn't matter. And I hear actually a lot of people saying, networking doesn't matter. I just want my apps up there. So I'm curious how we might interpret that and how we might respond. Obviously, it matters to um, VMware very much now. Networking doesn't matter. Well, of course, networking matters, because the attendees in this room would say that. Um, I, at the end of the day, really, what business cares about is, is the applications to achieve their goals. And networking is a means for those applications to achieve that. So the networking uh, piece of that is to be able to uh, work with the framework of fast provisioning of applications, rapid deployment cycles that are happening. And that's the, the type of uh, innovations that I really see coming in networking today. Um, of course, as we get to the future, that'll uh, continue. Yeah, this is a very good question. What we view that uh, the IT doesn't matter and or it really implies the whole business. IT used to be in the back end. It's more moving towards the business marketing, customer engagement, the whole life cycle on the business side. So it implies the back end support. You know, you can move to the cloud, you can move, and network does matter. And uh, that's why we are here. And uh, everyone or believe the networks become more and more significant, important, virtualization, abstraction, but by the end, it's the business. How can we solve the uh, IT transformation? And all we call, we are called ICD transformation because not just IT and CT substantially in the transformation as well. Yeah. Beyond the data center? Yeah, I, I think 
at least coming from the carrier side, it was always the network, the application people didn't care because they didn't have to deal with it. It just worked, right? You, or it didn't work, whatever the case may be. And there wasn't an easy way for the application to communicate or interface directly with the network. And, Moderator to run. <laughs> and I think what we need to do as a group is figure out ways to integrate the application directly into the network and allow the applications to have more visibility into what's happening at the edge so the IT guys can take responsibility for the entire delivery of that service. Yeah. Um, I think totally the network is important to the applications. I mean, at the end of the day, apps need to talk to one another. The, the network is the plumbing for doing that. Um, a lot of the, the starting point where I think um, uh, many people have been in is the network has let them down historically that it's easy to provision a VM, it's easy to provision an, uh, an app, and you might have a, a systems team or apps teams that do that, but to provision the resources in the network took hours, days, weeks, months, whatever, to get that provision. So automation is the key. Um, I don't think people really want I don't think people really want to be running expect scripts or uh, awful things for automation. I hope we've moved on from that. And um, it's, uh, I think that's the sort of the, the, uh, the starting point, certainly for what we see a lot of with uh, OpenStack, the automation is probably the most important piece, uh, allowing people to bring up and tear down things and sort of uh, not have to be relying on a, on a human manually configuring all those things. Yeah, um, sorry, I was running a scheduling conflict. Um, my name is Mark McLean. I'm the program technical lead for OpenStack Networking Project, Neutron. So, sorry. Um, I walked in and went. No, so we, were, we were making up our own questions. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Um, does networking matter? Absolutely, to me, yeah. Um, so, you talked a little bit about the ability to having the ability to orchestrate and have the applications configure the network. Um, you know, we have some of that support today, we're looking a little bit down the road, you know, three years from now. What are some of those next steps that we can do some of the basic constructs in terms of orchestration? Yeah, actually, um, I just gave a whole talk on that. <laughs> um, but I think that we've, we've seen in, in, when we think of OpenStack as being this uh, platform layer between applications and the underlying infrastructure, whether it be physical, virtual, and everything else. We've been very intent in the entire Neutron project of making that communication happen, having an application express what it needs, either at setting up its own logical, isolated networks. Um, and I think where we're, we're seeing it moving as orchestration becomes much more part of, of OpenStack, we want to be able to involve the orchestration that's happening within the infrastructure with the orchestration that the applications, in fact, are doing and make those, that conversation happen. So I view that, you know, that having this, we're actually going to be in and out of Cisco making this big announcement application-centric infrastructure. And it's really about, though, having these constructs and abstractions such as policy. Instead of talking about all of the wiring, talk about the policy that you want to have the infrastructure, and, you know, provide for you from these, you know, the, from your web front ends back into your mid, middle tier and database and everything else. So I think orchestration is one of those things that is really uh, coming now into OpenStack and it'll apply into the infrastructure as well. And I think we have to take it outside of the data center. We, there's been a lot of focus on how do we do this within the data center, but you know, one of the biggest challenges is, especially in Asia, it's a big place. And applications are being used and delivered across the entire, the entire region. And how do we take those same constructs and those same policies and deploy them not only in Hong Kong, but in Singapore and in China and Australia and, and then globally across there? And the carriers have to come up and step up. We've been the bottleneck for many years as to doing this and not provide the flexibility and the means to consume network resources the same way we consume compute resources, for example. And there needs to be changes in that entire industry to do that. I want to further emphasize what John just described. Yes, exactly, the distributed data center because the intelligence edge and the edge network edge for the carrier hardly distributed. And this is something overview to significant importance and currently has not been addressed in OpenStack or in Neutron. So this is where area Huawei also 
you know, as a gold member, we are going to further emphasize you know, how we can contribute. This is significantly important for the orchestration automation across the carrier network and across multiple data centers. And this is area we need to build an ecosystem. The, a Neutron is a great platform, the flexibility to create innovation. And this is where we are going to further uh, look into it. So, um, one of the things I think that, uh, uh, I guess one of the directions we'll sort of see things going in, um, I think there is some really neat, exciting uh, technologies within networking that um, are sort of really relevant moving forward. Um, from, let's say, Arista's perspective, we're very bullish on technologies like um, protocols like VXLAN, for example. It allows you to extend uh, a virtual network uh, outside of a data center. Uh, it allows you to go outside of a pod. Um, you can do it in software. Um, you can do it in Neutron today. Uh, you can do it in hardware. Um, and it sort of becomes, it, it's also a way that you get beyond the construct of like a VLAN. So uh, suddenly you're no longer constrained in a multi-tenant environment to 4K tenants or things like that. Um, uh, there's sort of lots of things of how I think networks will evolve. Um, I, I'd certainly agree with Lou that applications are important and obviously Cisco's got an announcement on that tomorrow. You know, we had an announcement on that uh, yesterday. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun time to be in networking this week. But uh, um, where, uh, where there will be some really interesting uh, developments and, and it will be fascinating to see sort of how it pans out over time, I think one of the most uh, exciting things about, for example, what OpenStack enables is literally the open ecosystem and it's ultimately about giving the end users choice on uh, how you go about orchestrating things, how you go about managing it, uh, your choice of controller, um, your choice of technology, whether you do it in hardware or software or whatever. And uh, um, that's uh, something that I think is, uh, uh, I don't think we've actually quite seen the degree of innovation going on in networking. Um, for a long, long time. So, so I just want to add quickly that I, I agree with both uh, Lou and your points on um, applications and is particularly policy with the networking. Um, Neutron has provided a great platform for innovation above and below the abstraction. And we've seen advances in application delivery, self-service, all kinds of great stuff that you can get today. To some people, it's, it's future still, but it's really near term and it's available as uh, products today. On the policy side, this is something where I don't see those abstractions quite available in OpenStack yet. And uh, I think that it's actually a bigger problem than just networking. Networking is a very large piece of it, uh, but it's something that needs to uh, both happen inside and outside the data center and also inside and outside of networking across the cloud. There is a, there is a blue. We just initiated a blueprint, actually, uh, with, with Cisco and IBM, Juniper and others, really so we can have that discussion. And I think we will find it's going to be more than just the network because we really are saying it's a much easier way to always have a policy-driven, you know, declarative way of saying what you want to have happen and also accommodate the needs that then the real world needs that you have a group which sets that policy. You know, and now applications should be able to spun up within that policy within the teams, and so that's where I think we're trying to take some of the blueprint work. Okay. Um, would you, one of the things that was interesting is anybody in the audience have any questions you'd like to ask of our panelists? Yes. So the question, just to repeat, um, if you, when you take a look at OpenFlow and SDN in term, where, where are we on the maturity curve as far as technology goes? <laughs> well, that depends how you define SDN. And I like uh, Mark, well, you, you could define it as OpenFlow. Uh, Martin defines it as uh, cool stuff in networking. And so, you know, everyone has their own interpretation of it. Um, so there are solution, SDN solutions today. There's several products that you can buy, install, test out in your labs. 
uh, today. So I think it, we're very mature on that. But SDN as a term is so broad and it has completely different applicability in the data center versus in the carrier space. So depending on your particular needs, I think there's uh, solutions in, in, very, in all areas. Uh, yes, uh, that's very much echo what you just described. Uh, this SDN, there's a narrow band, narrowly defined SDN regionally, but which is now, I think everyone, even the definition of open flow much go beyond what the regional, you know. Uh, but what I believe from business perspective, every vendor or target the customers has their own strategy, either it's a hybrid model, either it's an overlay, or it's a completely decoupling model, and it will pan out in different market segments. Each one carrier has, or our vendors have their own strategy to move at a different entry strategy level. So SDN, as from that perspective, is still emerging in a much broader sense of SDN, okay? And think well, eventually market will pan out. And overall, we truly believe it's, like, uh, it's not just networking alone, it's more a converged infrastructure for the data center across the server, storage, and networks. And the big challenge in the operation side of the IT, you know, the network guys wouldn't talk to the IT you know, server guys or, or very different organization. That transformation would take a much longer time than the technology itself in reality. Yeah, I think the key word in that is software. Uh, and we're, whether you're calling it software-defined infrastructure, software-defined data centers, there's been a lot of terms, but I hear that from the customers all the time. The age of having network engineers log into a router or a switch and make changes then across you know, 45 of those things and doing that flawlessly, um, we know we, we just can't go down that road. Instead, we're applying automation, and, and so now it becomes what are the APIs you know, what capabilities do they have? What are the orchestration systems you use? And I think that's actually a richer conversation than narrowly around, you know, open flow is a protocol. You know, and so what we really are talking about is how do we reach this level of maturity in using software to, def to instead of just define your infrastructure, but actually make your infrastructure responsive, responsive to the needs of the applications and things that are going on, whether it be failures or whether it being flows and everything else like that. So. The software component is that is what I've seen that big shift in the last couple of years. Everybody now wants a software-defined data center or infrastructure. So, uh, uh, given the announcement we had yesterday, um, <laughs> we, we kind of think it's mature because we just rolled open flow across the whole network and have exposed that actually to the consumer. So, I think it's mature enough that we can actually expose it to the developers so they can break it for us. Um, the, the real challenge we have as a carrier, it's exactly what you said. It's getting out of people used to logging into a router and executing, you know, Junos or iOS or doing something that they're used to, and now we're hiring system engineers to manage our network. And from a carrier, that's a very scary thing to some regards. But it's also finding customers that are able to go and utilize it. Now that we gave you these tools um, and we can support them, how are you going to go and build on top of that? And that's, I think, when we can get that level, we'll see it become even more mature than it is today. Yeah, so um, Arista, we basically were doing, I guess, what's called STN these days before it was called STN. So the idea was that we're open, extensible, um, you can do anything you want. So, you know, you log on a switch, uh, it's running Linux, we don't hide that. So we have people running all sorts of things, um, Chef Puppet, CF Engine, uh, whatever for automation, they've been doing that. We've been doing OpenStack uh, for a long, long time, uh, sorry, OpenFlow for a long, long time as well. The, the challenge, let's say, with OpenFlow on physical hardware switches is you're constrained by the size of the forwarding tables. It's great that you can do these 12 tuple or 10 tuple for matching traffic in OpenFlow. Um, the challenge is there's this finite resource called a TCAM that uh, uh, isn't an infinite resource and in fact, um, on much um, cost-effective silicon um, is a fairly scarce resource. So there is, I guess, uh, uh, choices for SDN. Um, you know, people have certainly built applications on it. You can use it for exception routing, things like that. Um, but, you know, are you actually going to be doing uh, holding, doing flow-based switching of every 
uh, UDP flow, every TCP flow, no, uh, that, that just will not scale. But you could be using it for aggregate traffic, uh, doing polices, things like that. But um, at a sort of a high level, STN, um, I tend to think of STN as, uh, stands for still don't know. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, you could, uh, we could ask everyone in this room today what STN means to them and I'm sure that we get as many answers as, as there are people here. So, um, but to some extent it's a, uh, um, a we kind of categorise it as um, allowing you the flexibility to do whatever it is you want to do from the equipment you have and uh, maybe that you haven't been able to do in the past, so. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll start and we'll go around this way, I guess. Um, sure. So the concept of overlay networks, um, Arista, we were a big, big believer in VXLAN and we, uh, I think, uh, we're certainly one of the switch vendors that has a hardware VXLAN gateway capability. Um, we're a big believer in the separation of the overlay from the underlay. Um, the overlay provides the, the, uh, the concept of virtual tenants, VNIs is, is what it's called in VXLAN, <coughs> and the underlay you kind of have flexibility at how you build a network at layer two, layer three, uh, what routing protocols you use. Um, the, the key of any of it is, to, to my mind, is you, you build a, a robust underlay in whatever way is possible. Um, I don't believe in sort of reinventing um, protocols for the, yeah, for the fun of it kind of thing. Um, BGP or OSPF works particularly well today. Um, you know, we have um, speaking personally, we have some of the largest cloud networks in existence with, you know, pods of 200,000 plus servers inside a single pod. And, um, you know, so clearly it scales. Um, they have sub-second convergence, so it's, um, you know, why reinvent that? And certainly BGP is, you know, used across the internet. It works perfectly fine there for connecting people together. So um, that's exactly it. Now, from an overlay, VXLAN is one choice. Uh, there's MVGRE from Microsoft is another choice. Uh, NYSERA had STT. Um, it's a bit harder to do STT in a hardware switch, um, but um, you know, I don't know that there's a clear choice winner, um, but I think there's certainly a lot of momentum behind VXLAN as the underlying technology, but to be honest, it's dependent on what the silicon supports. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I think actually the overlay networks are actually dynamic because essentially you have a control of pushing the policy. Um, VXLAN started out, uh, just talking about VXLAN specifically, it started out life with multicast as a transport and um, that's what the IETF draft for it has. The reality is what's actually been implemented by any, everyone is, um, uh, or where it's going is to a unicast transport which requires a controller to define the endpoints for where what's called the VTEPs are. Um, However dynamic that is, is it's the control that pushes out that policy. So it could be as dynamic as you want it to be. So, Not sure I have much to add to that. <laughs> From a carrier perspective, we look at outside the data center and we use, to me, the best protocol needs to be used in the right environment. And I think there's different protocols that we need to use depending on latency and all the other things that we see in the network. Um, I'm an old IP engineer, still a fan of going back to my BGP and OSPF days. So I think you have to look at where you're serving that and what you're doing in that particular realm and, and pick the best solution for that. We're leaning towards VXLAN um, just because it's easy to implement and there's a lot of implementations out there. So I'll take a stab. When it comes to the actual overlay protocols, I think we have a variety of options there, and that's great. If you're running hardware ASICs, VXLAN is an excellent protocol for that. If you're running on t today's x86 hardware, STT has optimizations that make that faster. Um, at, at VMware, our solution is hinged upon network virtualization, and what we take that to mean is that we have to faithfully reproduce all of networking 
in the overlay effectively. Um, so that doesn't, that's uh, not just limited to L2, but also L3, L4 through 7 services. And of course, if I say L3, that includes uh, static and dynamic routing. So your off -ramp, on and off ramp into the overlay is a critical component of the overall system and a key area for development. So I guess kind of to rephrase, with the commoditization of hardware and networking, um, standardization tends to run slower, so how do we innovate? How do we keep the pace of innovation high? Because, you know, you take, considering like V6, the standard was from 1995, you take a look at the penetration today, you know, software-defined networking, like you said, is kind of hard to nebulous to define. So we have, brand, we have different interfaces. Is that a problem towards innovation? I mean, John, for instance, you've rolled it out, it, or was that, is, did that enable you to move faster, or would, did you run into unexpected problems in providing it to your customers? No, I, I would say that was actually what allowed us to do it. There were so many choices, and most importantly, SDS and SDN. It was software-defined, right. so if it didn't work, we could rewrite it, or we can route it, write it around it, and we can fix what we needed to fix at that point. Mm -hmm. um, without that ability, it would have been almost impossible for us to roll out what we've rolled out over the last couple of months. Actually, you know, um, historically, if you think back in the early days of networking or of the internet, you know, it was software running on general purpose computers. And so we've come sort of full circle, I think. And that we, but what we recognized in, in the time being was that actually the general purpose computers could not handle the performance. So I think that just like we're seeing GPUs coming into, um, you know, computers to increase their performance, you know, better NICs and things like that that there'll always be this sort of oscillation, I think, between how much, where we understand something really well, we can build ASICs and, and to perform those very specific functions. And what we're recognizing now, I think, is actually it's always software and hardware working together, applied where, where you need to. And so I, I don't think this is by any means leads to the ultimate complete commoditization of, of hardware because that would recognize that we know completely what we're, what we're doing in this. And instead, yeah. it's really the involvement of software with hardware working together to deliver the, the networks of the future. Uh, it's a good question. So everyone's in, mind, in that kind of thinking. So I think if we look at it from business perspective, it's the TCO, okay? It's the end-to-end -end solutions. So if you can say, yes, hardware commoditized, the OpenStack commoditized the infrastructure software. The SDN open source commoditize it. So if you look at open end-to-end -end solution perspective from IT perspective, the RPAX part is 80%. The hardware is 20%. Okay, and the RPAX is continuing to grow. 
what make it difficult for IT infrastructure for, uh, business transformation is in the RPAX orchestration over our cost. Yes, if you look at the statistics show, look at over the last 10 years, you look at the server technology, price change, and storage network, very much follow the Moore's law. Not just the server, the chip technology has been happening as well. So there will be continually important, the certain significant intelligence in the hardware, especially in the data plan. The data plan doesn't mean, you know, it's dumb, it's a, it's a data plan also complicated, uh, and it will be continue to be there. It's how do you play out the intelligence and the control and how are the best combination of the two and to reduce the total cost of ownership for, and, and also enable the care or in the operators to transform their business. Yeah, on the, I, I really agree with what you're saying on the total cost of ownership. I think commoditization really simplifies the problem beyond um, what the, the reality on the ground. I think when we look at something like Neutron, where we have a well-defined platform, what that enables is for innovation to occur both above and below the platform, and they can occur separately. And when that happens, you uh, create competition among the vendors of, of the technology, and competition leads to innovation, it, uh, it also might lead to commoditization in, in some instances, uh, but innovation, uh, that competition is, and innovation is ultimately the winner is the consumer. So I think we're in a really good spot right now with these uh, interfaces that have been defined. So I do have a little bit of a follow-up question that I'm self-interested in being at Neutron, P Neutron PTL. So we define these interfaces. Do you find that the community process is fast enough for your speed, slow enough, too slow for moving? It's always too slow. Yeah. It's always too yeah. slow. It's probably too, you know, for those of us contributing, I think it's always moving too slow. Mm -hmm. And but for the people who are trying to consume it, it's moving too fast. So we're trying to strike that right balance. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also trying to do that through the separation of concerns. And that's why the way that that Neutron was constructed, that we can have a slow moving interface for our users that can incrementally add features and we can open up the bottom of Neutron or whatever to, for all the new technologies that are being developed without disrupting what the user expects. So I think we've done a great job in terms of the overall architecture allowing those two things to happen, that innovation above and below the platform. Any other questions? Any other questions? One last question. Yes. So the question is, um, the software capabilities give developers a lot of power to configure and um, deploy their application, but at the same time, you get a lot of, when you have that power, there's a lot of great responsibility. Do you, how do you limit it? How do you ensure that they have success and configure it in a manner which makes applications successful? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Actually, I'll give a very short answer. I think that is a very key question. Um, what's interesting, we're, we're dealing in a multi-tenant world, right? And that one, one, that arbitration between the desires of the different tenants is what, what OpenStack has to sort of provide. You can't let one, one tenant take over all of the virtual you know, VMs that you can possibly have, nor could it take over all the swamp, you know, pull up all of the available bandwidth in the system. I think that you know, networking actually has always been multi-tenant. I mean, it's been carrying traffic from all the different applications, and we've got quality of service and those kinds of ways to try to prioritize traffic, but I think there's gonna be a lot more work needed there as we see a lot more demands being pushed by these applications that now all of a sudden have the power to make these kinds of requests. Do we have any more time? Is that... Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. I think uh, you're touching upon a key point, which is that uh, we do now have all this uh, power to do things, but 
there's uh, governance compliance and business policy issues that are at play here. And having a uh, foundation for declaring that policy in a standard way that uh, these other components can ingest is, I think, a key area for development to help tackle that problem. Um, just kind of wrap up, as you can see, there's a lot of exciting um, action going on in terms of networking and software and applications. And so I'm very thankful to have our entire panel here today. So thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you.